so you're a Kennedy person. Yes, I am Kennedy a institute. Yeah, I, I, I spent a semester there once with a with a professor Fluck a long time ago. Good yeah, experience. I, my PhD advisor was Frank Helleter, who is the person who succeeded um, Andrew Fluck okay. in his position. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So I have popular culture studies background, and I think you'll see this in the talk today. So I do in my teaching do a lot of, of 19th century as well, and I'm really interested in specifically depictions of the 19th century city. Mm -hmm. um, and I've taught a class uh, that was called Americans in Europe, where we looked at different different um, American authors travel writing about their travels in European countries. Mm -hmm. This is sort of connected to that. Yeah, and I think Wonder that wonderful. That's exciting. That's that's very exciting. Um, I'm probably going to ask some stupid things about uh, Henry James as well, who yes, really weird. comes into the picture somewhere when you do travel writing about, you know, and have Americans in Europe. But but this is great. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I can just give you the, the floor and you tell us what you want to tell us, Maria. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy, for, for organizing this beautiful lecture series and I'm, and for having me in it. Um, and as you said, this is sort of the first talk that I'm giving as a new member of the Freiburg English Studies Department. And I'm really happy that's for you, Cor. Um, and when you asked me what I could see myself contributing when it comes to 19th century women's writing, the first person that I had to think of is Alcott for the reason that um, her book, Little Women, is one of the most popular bestsellers possibly of all time. And it's arguably the most successful book written by a woman in the 19th century. And it's also the book about, um, the 19th century book about girlhood, about family life, but also about female independence. And Alcott is a really fascinating person as well. Right, um, so this book, Little Women, um, has never gone out of print since it was published for the first time in 1868. So the longevity of this, um, of its success is also quite remarkable and important to know. Um, and it's a childhood classic that many people that grew up reading uh, in the US and still continue to grow up reading in the US, in the UK, in, in many Anglophone countries. I certainly read it as a kid growing up in South Africa. So um, this is, yeah, one of those childhood classics. Um, and to start, <laughs> I have, well, let's see. To ha I have a couple of quotes here of celebrity fans of the book, and maybe someone wants to guess in the chat who people are. I've given you the years to, um, yeah, as a hint, <laughs> guess about who the people are. So the first person says, I have read and reread Little Women, and it never seems to grow old. Then another person, at the cost of being deemed effeminate, um, I will add that I greatly like the girls' stories worship little men and little women and an old-fashioned girl and then I, didn't, I identified myself passionately with joe she was much more tomboyish and daring than i was but i shared her horror of suing and housekeeping and her love of books um little women came to mind as soon as i asked myself what a woman writing looks like i know that joe march must have had real influence upon me when i was a young scribbler i am sure that she has influenced many girls where she's not, like most real authors, either dead or inaccessibly famous, nor like so many artists and books is she set apart by sensitivity or suffering or general superlativity, nor is she, like most authors and novels, male. She's close as a sister and common as grass. Where else could we have read about an all-female group who discussed work, art, and all the great questions, or found girls who wanted to become women and not vice versa? And then finally, I felt as though I was a part of Joe and she was a part of me. So I'll just leave um, <laughs> Wolfgang's daughter is not among the people who said these things, though. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you named her after Joe. Um, so while you guess, um, maybe people have ideas who any of these, these celebrity readers are. Let me just briefly give you the structure of my talk, because I feel like, especially with online talks, it's always really helpful to know which parts of the talk we're at. Um, so I'll start out with Little Women um, 
and then continue with with Alcott's biography um, to give you that context. Then I'll move on to sort of a general cultural history intro um, that also has some other authors in it about U.S. American travel to Europe in the 19th century, um, and then move on in the final section to two different texts and two different trips that Alcott. So two different trips that Alcott took her big two big European trips and the writing that was inspired by them. And the first trip, you read parts of Little Women for today, um, two chapters that were inspired by this first trip. And then I have this another text, um, Shawl Scraps, that I find is really fascinating that I have a couple of quotes from and want to bring to your attention. Right, but first let's resolve the question of the celebrity readers. Did anyone write anything in the chat? Let's see. Not that easy, but let's go on. Come on. Okay. So the first person is Jane Adams. Theodore Roosevelt felt does not want to be deemed effeminate. Um, then we have Simone de Beauvoir, who identified passionately with Joe. Um, Ursula Le Guin, um, I really like that quote. Um, and then Gloria Steinem, and finally the amazing Anne Petri. So a lot of female authors and female thinkers who were inspired. Um, yeah, and this is just a selection of, of some, there were so many more, but these are just a selection of interesting quotes that I found. Now, Little Women um, is a novel about four, different, four very different women, four very different girls, the March sisters, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy. Um, and their characterization is carried through not only the novel, but it's different audiovisual afterlives as well. So to introduce the four characters as someone in popular culture studies, um, I have screenshots from different movie adaptations, um, and we really could do an entire talk on these movie adaptations as well. So there's movies from 1917, 1918, silent films, um, 1933, 49, 94, 2018, and then 2019. Um, and yeah, you see some of the screenshots here. On the right side, I thought this was interesting to put with this as well. We have um, the original um, um, illustration done that's kind of famous by, by Alcott's sister, uh, May, of the different sisters gathering around their mother to read letters. Right, so um, the novel in many ways has served and continues to serve different cultural zeitgeists if we want. Um, and the most recent one in the most recent adaptation is that it's sort of a popular feminist take um, on Joe's and Alcott's professional authorship. This is the Greta Gerwig adaptation from 2019. Um, and in another interesting, edit, uh, another interesting book on Little Women, The Afterlife of Little Women, Beverly Leon Clark demonstrates how little women in different um, periods became associated with different things. So most recently popular feminism, but for instance, it was associated with sentimentalism and domesticity in early decades of the 20th century, and then with sort of innocence and naivete between the 1930s and 1960s. So there's definitely changes to how the novel was viewed um, in different phases. Now to move to the different sisters, this is just a really quick run through the different characters. Um, there's Mag, who's the oldest, um, who marries early in the book and who sort of marries beyond her station. She marries for love, um, um, but then struggles to accommodate her desire for luxury with this new class status that she has. So she marries basically um, a man who is poor, poor, but marries for love um, and then struggles to cope with this. This is based on Alcott's sister, Anna, who also like, like Meg worked as a teacher and um, yeah, the character, her husband, the character um, of John Brooke in the book is um, is Anna's husband, John Pratt, who will talk, appear again in the talk later on as well. Then there is Joe, Josephine March, the second eldest, as you heard from, from de Beauvoir's characterization, tomboyish character, um, sometimes read as a queer character because of the androgynous name, um, based on Alcott herself and a uh, passionate writer. Here you have the interesting quote at the bottom of the illustration. 
there are several passages in the novel where John in this writing frenzy is in her so-called vortex and, and they get these beautiful descriptions of the writing process and how she's drawn into this writing process. So she's a passionate writer. She's also very rebellious and outspoken and impulsive. There are several passages with in which um, her anger comes through. So she's not perfect in the novel, not idolized, but there's definitely impulsiveness and anger. Um, unlike Alcott, Joe does marry by the end um, of the novel. So the end of the Good Wives. Um, she does not marry her childhood friend, Lori, but she marries the older German intellectual, Dr. Baer. And this has been a source of controversy for uh, many generations of readers. Um, there's an interesting comment on Alcott who said, quote, I won't marry Joe to Laurie to please anyone, unquote. But readers would continue to send um, letters, fan letters complaining about this, this marriage to Alcott's publisher, um, even up to the publisher. We know that the publisher got letters even up to like 45 years after her death. So this has been a source of controversy for a long time. And on a side note, I asked you to read this um, secondary text, this excellent secondary text by Laura Dessa Walls, um, and that gives us more background information um, on Professor Baer and the German intellectual Charles Follen, who was Harvard's first instructor of German language and literature, who um, Dessa Walls and other Alcott scholars speculate um, that this actual person whom Louisa did not know, but she knew his widow, Eliza, um, was a stand-in for, for Bear, and why that matters to have a German intellectual as the ideal father and husband figure. So yeah, um, that's something that's really interesting, that text as a background. Finally, oh no, third sister, Beth, um, who is Shy and quiet, focused on housework and her family. She's a talented piano player and often compared to old fashioned heroines of, of novels like those by Charles Dickens. She's too angelic to survive, people often say. So she dies after, um, um, she dies from, from scarlet fever. Um, and it's really interesting because one of my favorite authors, uh, Carmen Maria Machado, offers a very compelling reading of the character of Beth. Um, from sort of a disability studies perspective. Um, and Machado argues that Little Women doesn't really do justice um, to Beth and to the Alcott sister that Beth is based on, namely um, Alcott's youngest, younger sister, Lizzie, who's also, also struggled with her health her whole life. Um, and, Al and Machado says, Lizzie's family had a narrative about her and it killed her, not just once, but over and over again. A woman who lived and had thoughts and made art and was snarky and strange and funny and kind and suffered tremendously and died angry and the world at the world becomes soft, sweet Beth, a dear and nothing else. So it's really interesting within this context of sort of equating the characters and the the actual sisters. Beth always is or Lizzie, the sister um, is always the one who, who doesn't really live up to her potential. And yeah, Machado draws interest, draws attention to that. And then finally, and this is the person, the character that is likely as important for this talk as Joe is. We have Amy, the youngest sister, who's in the novel in many ways a foil for Joe. Um, she's at times antagonistic. She's vain and interested in beauty and popularity, and. One of the most tragic moments of Little Women is when Amy burns um, a manuscript of Joe's that's revenge. But then Amy is also the character who changes um, the most in the course of the novel. Uh, she's a talented painter, and the two chapters that I asked you to read for today are ones, one is an epistolary chapter from her perspective, and the other is her, um, written by her, and the others from her perspective. And these are about her travels to Europe and how she writes back to the, her family. Amy is based on May, Alcott's sister, who's also a painter and who illustrated um, many of Alcott's works. Um, and this is including Little Women, and you've already seen a couple of the illustrations, and here's another one. Um, so now that you know the sisters, I've already quoted Carmen Maria Machado, and another interesting thing that she addresses 
in her essay on Beth and Little Women is how Little Women develops this clear distinction of its central characters and asks audiences to identify with them. And I have the quote on the slide. So Machado says, Little Women was an early example of character archetypes as clearly mappable Cosmo, so cosmopolitan Cosmo magazine style personality types, a prototype for Harry Potter houses. Are you Joe, the Gryffindor of the group, brave who suffers no fools while also being insufferable, thinks quite highly of herself, the author insert character everyone wants to be. Or maybe you're Amy, power hungry, silly, vain, slithering, obviously, Joe's main antagonist within the family. Perhaps Mag, Ravenclaw, dull in personality, but smart and interested in the finer things in life. Or maybe, heavens forfend, your Hufflepuff, Beth, pure and loyal, dowdy and dead. Um, yeah, so that's, I think, a really fun summary um, of the ways that, yeah, the novel doesn't really do justice to Beth, but also of the different archetypes and, and why maybe the novel continues to be so popular. Now, aside from the four sisters that you've now had an introduction to, there's a prominent mother figure, Marmee. However, the father is absent uh, for large parts of the novel when he's in the Civil War. Um, and even after his return, he's barely a presence in the novel at all. He plays such a minor role in the novel. And many Alcott scholars think that this is Alcott's way of talking about her family um, and basically criticizing her father without really laying the blame on her father for not providing for them financially. And again, this is also where I can point you to Dessa Wall's text, where she argues that Joe's husband, Professor Bear, serves as an ideal father figure and husband, not despite, but because he is German, as sort of the head of this transnational um, ideal family. Now, we should always be hesitant, we know this as literary scholars, about conflating an author with their work. But it is really interesting from a literary history perspective that Alcott herself and her different publishers over the years encouraged the conflation of Alcott and her family with Joe Mar and the Marches. Um, in her private writing, in her letters published and unpublished, and her journals, Alcott sometimes conflates her sisters and conflates the names. So she does call May Amy and she does call um, Anna Meg and, and yeah. Lizzie Beth and so on. And then the most recent adaptation, Greta Gerwig's 2019 adaptation, further builds on this conflation and blurs the distinctions between character Joe and Alcott um, by presenting the film's ending, by turning the film's ending into, um, or, or presenting Joe's marriage to Bear as um, part of, of the novel that she's writing. So basically there's a fiction within a fiction here. Um, instead of this being Joe's story, it's part of a story that Joe writes for an audience and has published as a novel. So basically Joe becomes Alcott in this movie and it's a really interesting ending um, where Joe is not married, but an unmarried author. Um, and that really works well with this sort of feminist take on, on the most recent adaptation. But this helps as a segue into the next part on Alcott's biography. Uh, she was born in Germantown near Philadelphia in 1832. And this is here, her on the left here, to a prominent but impoverished New England family. This is her father and mother. And she was the second of four daughters. Her parents were Abigail May and Amos Bronson. Her mother was an activist for different causes, um, including temperance, suffrage, and the abolition of slavery. And interestingly, her mother um, is often listed as one of the first paid social workers um, in the US. Her father was a transcendentalist, thinker, educator, and reformer. Uh, and Alcott's daughters, so, so the sisters grew up in this transcendentalist network um, of Boston, of Concord, Massachusetts. Here's a picture of their later house. Um, Louisa taught at her father's school. He had several schools over the years. She took lessons by Emerson and was acquainted with Thoreau, with Margaret Fuller, as well as Nathaniel Hawthorne and his family. 
When she was 10, Alcott and her family moved to the Utopian Fruitlands, um, which is close to Boston. And this is a commune that her father founded as an experiment in community living. And like so many communes, it failed um, very quickly. It failed shortly after it was founded. And this is an experience that Luisa then fictionalized in her text, Transcendental Wild Oats. Um, and yeah, Dessa Walls again gives us more context about this and reads it as a witty morality tale pitting the foolish improvidence of male idealism against the wise management of female pragmatism. So there's an interesting gender conflict here. Um, throughout her childhood, Luisa grew up in relative poverty. Her family nearly constantly was in financial difficulties. Um, both of her parents endorsed these financial difficulties as virtuous and character building as a means to develop a rich spiritual life. And Alcott scholars highlight that this childhood poverty and um, that this specific upbringing was what motivated Luisa to earn a living for her family um, and to provide not only for herself, but for her entire family instead of getting married. The path that she chose after working as a seamstress, as a teacher and governess was, of course, publishing um, from an early age onward. And she basically started publishing short stories and plays when she was very young. Her first published book was Flower Fables, and I think I have the cover. Yeah, it's Flower Fables um, in 1854. This is a collection of nature fairy tales. They were written uh, when she was 17, and uh, famously she had told these tales. She had invented them uh, for Ellen Emerson, that's Ralph Waldo Emerson's daughter. Um, and this was published, written when she was 17, published when she was 22. What's also interesting, and this goes back to our discussion that we had after Sammy's lecture on local color writers, is that Luisa early on decided to be a commercial writer because she's writing to make money. And she decided to write popular genres such as thrillers, sensational novels, and children's literature for commercial purposes, for economical reasons. And this may be even though, or maybe because of, she grew up with this very different literary tradition of transcendentalism. Um, yeah, speaking of popular genres and popular culture, and this is a shout out to the next lecture in two weeks by Philip Schweighäuser, who will give the lecture on Emily Dickinson. Um, the TV show Dickinson, which is on Apple TV and has three seasons and is a very free adaptation of Dickinson's poems and her life. And it also has many references to contemporary popular culture and popular music in it. It also features an appearance um, by Alcott. So we have um, Shosha Mamet um, playing, playing Alcott here. And in the television show Dickinson, um, Alcott meets Emily Dickinson, even though we don't really know if they met. They certainly were in the same literary circles, um, but we don't have any record of them being acquainted with each other. And in the TV show, very true to the characterization that I just gave you, Mamet's Alcott is very practically oriented. She takes Emily Dickinson jogging um, and gives her a female perspective on being a professional writer. So she gives her advice in the publishing industry. And there's this really interesting quote from the TV show. I will not not talk about money since this is the reason that I'm in publishing. So Alcott very much writes to make a living which means being aware of her, who her readers are and what they want to read. And this is, of course, very different from Emily Dickinson. So it's really fascinating to have these two women meet in the fictional setting of the television show. And I hope this works, but I do have two short clips that are from the television show about this meeting. Um, yeah, and I'll show them. And I hope that the sound and everything works. We tested it before. So it should work. All right. Christmas, Evelina. It's Emily. Really? Yes. Come on in. How are you, Mr. Crosby? Oh, very well. Oh, okay. Very well. Oh. It's my first Christmas since my wife died. Oh. Both my daughters are married now, so I'm all alone. Well, we're happy to see you. Go go into the parlor. Help yourself to some spiced one. Oh, the Humphreys are here. Uh, why are you being so nice? Jane, it's Christmas. 
It's lovely to see you, Mr. and Mrs. Humphrey. And uh, this is our friend from Concord, Louisa Alcott. Oh, Louisa May Alcott. Oh, it's nice to meet you. Louisa's a published writer. Really? You're published? Oh, yeah. My first book just came out. It's called Flower Fables. It sold pretty well. I made $35. Oh, oh Louisa, you don't have to tell people exactly how much you made. Oh, why not? I did it for the money. Okay, let's go get some snacks. <laughs> what snacks? And uh, where is your mother? Oh, she's just upstairs. Well, go and get her, dear. All right, so this is the first clip, and then here is... And what about the documents? Oh, you guys are reading Bleak House. Oh, we're mainlining that shit. Me too. I'm at the part where Caddy and Prince Harry drop are about to have ah, their church No spoilers! Wedding. No spoilers! Ah. <laughs> See, this is what I need to write so many people really get hooked on, you know? I mean, that's how you're making the cash. <laughs> okay, Jane, seriously, what? My family's broke. My dad blew all his money starting that commune, and I gotta make a living somehow, and I'm not gonna be a governess. No, it's not a good option. Noted. Um... Jane says that you're a writer, too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, kind of. I'm not published. Okay. Well, I can help with that. Have you tried using a man's name? Yeah, once. That didn't work out. <laughs> but we should talk. Do you want to go for a run before dinner? A run? Yeah, I, I love to run. That's, like, an actual fact about me. My family likes to joke I might be part horse, but, um... That's beside the point. Anyways, uh, yeah, we should go for a run, and um, I'll give you some more writing advice. Okay. Just hope I'm not too fast. <laughs> you know, I just, yeah, I get going. <laughs> Actually, there are tons of women publishing nowadays. That's why Hawthorne called us a damned mob of scribbling women, but Hawthorne can eat a dick, am I right? <laughs> right. You can absolutely make a living as a writer. I mean, look at Fanny Fern. But her, her stories are so bonny. Well, sure, a body's just good for commercial. I mean, that shit sells. My father would kill me if I wrote like Fanny Fern. He wouldn't even let me publish a recipe for chicken soup. Well, sure, your family might disapprove. I mean, they may never speak to you again, but so what? You'll be out there making a living on your own? On my own. You can do it. Anyone can. You just can't be precious about it. Write what sells. Bodice rippers, ghost stories, something about ravens. Get tabs on the marketplace. Maybe throw in a line about corn or soap if you can get the soap company to pay you. Oh, and the best advice I can give you is this. Never get married. Huh? Don't do it. Don't throw your life away on a man who expects you to cook and clean and pop out little babies. I mean, in the time it takes you to raise one baby, you can write four or five novels and you can sell those novels. But I don't write novels, I write poems. Okay, that's another problem. I have to... I have to stop. Oh, skirts up! Log ahead! All right. So I'm glad that worked. And I could see Zygmunda laughing and people laughing, so that's good. All right. Um, so from the 1820s... Oh, this was a bit fast. Okay. But from the 1820s onward... The United States publishing industries expanded on an unprecedented scale with technological advancements and sophisticated marketing. Think of the soap company, get the soap company to pay you and you put a line in there, and the demand for mass-produced accessible fiction. And this market that became the domain of or the realm of the female domestic author. And the clip mentions Nathaniel Hawthorne who in his famous often cited letter to William Tickner in 1855, so one year after Alcott published her first book, Flower Fables, this is one year after, Hawthorne wrote, America is now wholly given over to a damned mop of scribbling women, and I should have no chance of success while the public taste is occupied with their trash. And should, I, and should be ashamed of myself if I did succeed. So this comment anticipates the kind of highbrow, lowbrow distinction of culture that would become so influential and continues to impact the way that we view popular culture in ways that draws par parallels between popularity and seeming aesthetic deficiency. And these parallels are so often gendered, racialized, and classed. Um, interesting comment on that. Um, so Hawthorne just 
distinguishes between the trash of mass market production and his own literature. Through his reliance upon a gendered rhetoric of commodification, Hawthorne casts the works of popular female authors as aesthetically deficient commodities, and so they're products of a newly emerging consumer culture. Um, and Louisa Jane Hodginson writes that because of this, a writer such as Louisa May Alcott therefore found herself in a double bind with her commercial and critical success dependent upon her conformance with middle class domestic values. This achievement similarly compounded her failure as a serious professional author. Um, so this is something that we need to, we can probably keep in mind for many of the authors that we have in our lecture series. The female writer in the 19th century is this unstable figure whose identity is debated and limitations and possibilities of her authorship um, and the ways that she is financed, uh, her employment um, is also constantly debated and this notion of who's a writer, who's an author, who's commercial, yeah. Interesting here is that um, her, one of the novels that she was really proud of, the female Bildungsroman Moods, was a critical and commercial failure. Um, and her hospital sketches, which is a lightly fictionalized account of her experiences as a civil war nurse, um, was only like a, was a modest success. Um, and this is really interesting because Wolfgang Hochburg will talk more about um, Alcott and um, her civil war writing. So I'll leave that out. But after these, this failure and this modest success is when her publisher suggested to her to try writing a book for children, which then became Little Women. Alcott was 36 when Little Women was published and it was instantly successful. And then she would go on to publish Good Wives, which was published in 1869. And in my copy, um, Little Women and Good Wives, as in many of the more recent copies, are sort of taken together as Little Women 1 and Little Women 2. Um, yeah, so Sammy corrected me that the chapters that I suggested to you, because my copy doesn't even signal that, um, are actually chapters from not Little Women, but Good Wives. Um, so yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, and then later she would write Little Men, in, which was published in 1871, and we'll, I'll talk more about that because it was written while she was in Rome and on her travels, uh, as well as a six volume series that is um, called Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag. Um, and it's basically Alcott used this literary persona of Aunt Jo um, to have this connection to her earlier work, um, but have a sort of a mature, more mature voice. Um, after the huge success of Little Women, she became the sole provider for her family, and she was taking care financially of her parents and her sisters, later her sister's children. Um, she kept an intense pace, continuing to write and publish throughout her whole lifetime, rarely slowing down. Louisa May Alcott published over two dozen books and over 300 articles or stories in periodicals. Uh, during the years 1868 to 86, she earned on book publications only royalties of approximately $103,375, which is an equivalent above 2.25 million today. And this is, um, this does not even include payments for her poetry, her, her stories, her serials, and the European editions of her work, because of course the European editions were also intensely successful. Um, something that I wasn't aware of and that I only found out when preparing this talk is even though her father was three, 33 years old when she was born, so he was 33 years older than her, she died only two days after him. Um, and she was at the age of, she was 55 when she died. Um, and the Norton Anthology of Literature puts it this way, quote, she quite simply had worked herself to death. So. At the time of her death in 1988, Alcott was raising her eight-year-old niece, Lulu, May's daughter, um, after May's death. She was also supporting her widowed older sister, Anna, and her two children. She was supporting her father. She had legally adopted Anna's son so he could inherit her copyrights and manage her estate. Um, and both sons of her her sister were working for publishers so this is a whole family business 
<laughs> All living members of her immediate family relied on her financially and for their employment. Alcott's death reflects the physical toll of this financial responsibility that she bore throughout her life and her chronic illness. So for a long time, people thought or scholars thought that her illness was the result of mercury poisoning from the treatments that she received when she conducted um, typhoid, fe typhoid fever during her Union Army service. But more recently, there have been readings that suggest that this is sort of an autoimmune disorder. disorder. Um, and this is really interesting when we think about female feminist scholarship um, on in the medical humanities that suggests this correlation between capitalism and gender and its impact on female bodies and autoimmune disorders. So it would be really interesting to sort of approach Alka from that perspective as well. But yeah, that is just a background. And now, and I'm sure you're all waiting for this already, we're moving to the US travel to Europe part of the talk. Um, and we'll get to her two travels to Europe. In general, of course, fiction is a form of traveling and American fiction specifically is often about traveling and thus highlights the special connection between mobility and US culture, um, as well as mobility and US capitalism. When it comes to US texts that are set about in Europe, it's really interesting because there's this projection of European cities as ripe for what we would today call city hopping um, as this very intrinsically US view of Europe layered with an appeal of cosmopolitanism. Um, and this brings us back to Henry James and his much proclaimed international theme for some of his publications published after Alcott more in the 20th century, but yeah. Um, the rise of mass tourism occurred in the 19th century and it enabled and was enabled through new technologies like the railroad and the steamship. So this is the first time when sort of mass travel um, and convenient, more convenient travel um, becomes available. So this mass travel um, turned what was for, before a European upper class tradition, that of the grand tour to different um, European cities. And it turned this into sort of a transatlantic travel practice of Americans who were equipped with texts by Henry James, by Mark Twain, and Louisa May Alcott, just as much as their um, travel guides, the Murray and Baedeker's handbooks for travel. And today these practices continue in these package deals advertised to let Americans experience the best of Europe in under two weeks or so. So all of these travel practices highlight from a US perspective, the relative proximity of different European capitals. Specifically in the writing of the 19th century, we sometimes encounter very practical instructions on places to visit and things to see and do in fictional writing. And we also find these networks of expatriates of US tourists either living in Europe for a longer time or traveling from different to different um, hotels and pensions. There's often scenes, uh, passages of transatlantic flirting, miscommunications and make-believe. And there's a lot of, at the time, a lot of hunting for spouses going on um, within these novels and outside of them. Alcott undertook two one-year trips to Europe and both of them greatly inspired her writing, as you will see. The first one was 1865 to 1866, when she accompanied the wealthy Anna Weld as a duenna. So this is a governess, companion, and chaperone. Um, she did separate from Weld in Switzerland and continued by herself. But for most parts, this was a work trip um, when she was not yet a professional writer. Um, and it did, yeah, it did influence her writing, as we will see in Little Women. So this was before her success. And five years later, um, when she was already quite the celebrity, she decided to travel to Europe again as a leisure trip to um, also avoid celebrity spotters, uh, to escape her celebrity, um, and to have basic, for relaxation. And this leisure trip was undertaken with uh, her friend Alice A. Bartlett, who's um, spoke many languages, ideal travel companion, and a poet, and her 30-year-old sister, May, who's a talented, as I said, the talented painter who inspired the character of Amy. 
Again, the goal of this trip was for Luisa to rest and recover her health. Um, and for May, whose first trip abroad, this was to visit art museums and take lessons with painters. So this is really interesting. The first trip was a work trip. The second trip was enabled through her successful fictions. Um, and in Little Women, we have these depictions of uh, Amy visiting Europe and writing back. And through selling this, Alcott made the money to then allow her actual sister to travel and study with painters, visit museums. Um, so the second was a leisure trip, but Alcott would not be Alcott if she didn't start writing again and working again while on the second trip. And I'll discuss Shaw's, Shaw's trips in a, in a few minutes, and that's an account of this trip. Um, maybe one thing that I can also clarify here is that what makes the Dessau Walls text so interesting and why I chose it for you as a reading is that that text really highlights the transatlantic exchange of literature at this time and the conception of different genres um, and the circulation of genre ideas and of labor and capital specifically um, in Europe and in the US. So Dessa Walls discusses this concept of cosmopolitanism um, in regard to Alcott's life and work and the ways that um, the, her cosmopolitanism is the, is the result of her upbringing, of her transcendentalist network, but also how she's connected to other female women, uh, other female, I'm sorry, other female writers. <laughs> and there's this interesting quote that I put on a slide from the text. So Dessa Walls writes that Alcott's choice to draw on a deep reservoir of cosmopolitan self-culture connects her with a complex network of transatlantic women. From Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley to Harriet Martineau, who we heard about last week, um, Elizabeth Peabody, Margaret Fuller, and beyond. Each of these writers found in cosmopo cosmopolitical thought and action the resource to reconceive herself as an independent, self unfolding intellectual, as well as the resources to conceive all women not only as full fledged citizens of a planetary cosmopolitical league, though that surely is breathtaking enough. But as agents whose work it could be to take Hans ethical revolution from theory to fact. And there's much more context for this, but I do think for the context of our or for the purposes of our lecture, this is really interesting how there's this trajectory of different women and this connection between these different women. Um, and even though I won't really be talking about cosmopolitanism much more, what the text also does really well is explain to us why. Cosmopolitanism is this ideal for Alcott. She's walking a tightrope there because, of course, from a US perspective, cosmopolitanism may always be perceived as a threat, as something that's threatening sort of an, a US American way of life, an American project. Um, and you can take this to the more extremes in the 1950s and McCarthyism and so on. But there's much more on that in her text. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge that here as well. All right, so let's move on to the first trip where she accompanied the invalid Anna Weld. Um, and Anna Weld was the daughter of, of a Boston shipping merchant, William Fletcher Weld, um, and diagnosed invalid, which means within the context of the Victorian age and the Gilded Age, respectively, a person who has fallen sick and continue to live as not healthy um, so couldn't take care of, of themselves, couldn't marry or take a, a profession and had to depend on others. And this is also another interesting link to Anna Rugemeyer's session on Harriet Martineau last week. And I'm sure Anna could give a much better definition of this 19th century con concept of invalid people um, and this understanding of, yeah, or maybe this links really well with Martineau's imaginary travels that let, allowed her to leave the sick room um, and then we have Alcott's actual travels to Europe and um, that she found so much pleasure in. However, and this is sort of an interesting fact, Weld, Anna Weld, even though diagnosed, uh, diagnosed as an invalid, continued to live, unlike Alcott, continued to live until, until she was 89 years old, had a child. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot to think about when it comes to this, this social diagnosis of invalid in the 19th century. Right, so they traveled, their trip would last from July 65 to July 66. It started in Liverpool and they toured the English countryside, then took them to Germany, crossed the Rhine into Switzerland, and then they continued to southern France. And you've read the two chapters um, 
31 are for foreign correspondent, which is the epistolary chapter. Amy writes back to her family and 37 new impressions. Um, and here are some of the different, maybe I won't read them for time reasons, but here's some of the different um, places that Amy visits or mentions in the letter um, and that you read about where she either was or she's writing from and Alcott visited most of these as well in a different order, however. Right. Um, we have many letters and her journals from the time. And in one journal, Alcott wrote that the trip was hard work, but I enjoyed it much. And one of her highlights was meeting a 20 year old Polish man, Ladislav Wisniewski, in uh, Vave in Switzerland. And we don't really know what he looked like, but this picture circulates on social media every couple of years whenever there's, there's um, another adaptation. So yeah, I, I wanted to share that with you, but it's not confirmed that this is actually what um, Ladi, as she called him, looked like. So in this Polish man, um, Luisa found a new friend with whom she would sail on the Lake Geneva and have pleasant walks and talks with him in the Chateau Garden and about the bay. Um, she then decided to leave Anna Weld and, um, in Nice in France and traveled to Paris, uh, in May to meet the young Polish men again. And they spent two weeks there together. And this is the source of much romantic speculation. Um, and should I tell you this here? Should I tell you this? I don't know. But what's really interesting that one of her friends with whom she later traveled, Alice, actually told, this must have been really scandalous at the time, but told this whole story of Laddie and uh, Louisa May Alcott to Henry James. And there's some, there's some Alcott scholars who suggest that this might have inspired his novella, Daisy Miller. So Alcott and Laddie um, and their possibly romantic meeting that that could have inspired Henry James when recollected through her, their mutual friend, Alice. Yeah, um, but what is really what we do know is that they remained friends, that they corresponded for several years, and that he would serve as a partial inspiration for the character of Laurie and Little Women. So Alcott wrote, Laurie is not an American boy, though every lad I ever knew claims um, the character. And Nathaniel Hawthorne's son has also famously claimed that the, he thinks the character was based on him. In Little Women, Laurie is born in Italy. And when he meets Amy in chapter um, 37 that you've read, there's this interesting quote where he appears transformed into this Euro-American cosmopolitan. So Laurie, quote, looked like an Italian, was dressed like an Englishman, and had the independence air of an American. Um, yeah, and there's another really interesting short story, Life and a Pension, that I was also thinking about giving you to read from uh, 1867, where two American cousins, Amy and Helen, meet this Polish man in a pension, and um, he sides with them against an American family that's there, who are Confederates and who are still adjusting to the loss of their property, including enslaved people after the Civil War. So we have this conflict between the South and the North play out on European soil and with this perspective of, of a Polish um, man sort of siding with the two American women. It's a really interesting story um, in the context of tourism abroad as well. In Little Women, to segue into your reading, the narrator tells us a bit condescendingly uh, before the chapter that you've read that Amy sailed away to find the old world, which is always new and beautiful to new eyes. And then in the first chapter that you've read, Amy describes this, the way that she sees this old world. And she says, I was glad to see the Irish coast and found it very lovely, so green and sunny with brown cabins here and there, ruins on some of the hills and gentlemen's country seats in the valleys with deer feeding in the parks. It was early in the morning, but I didn't regret getting up to see it, for the bay was full of little boats, the shore so picturesque, and a rosy sky overhead. I shall never forget it. So, as you will see, this is very different from Alcott's later travel writing. 
um, here we have Amy speaking with this very enthusiastic, but also naive appreciation of, of Europe and of the Irish coast. And also this, this painter's appreciation, finding it very picturesque. And it's almost in a way sort of bordering onto the cliched, um, especially when we contrast this with a later chapter, which is not told from Amy's direct perspective, but from a narrator, narrator's view. Um, and here Amy has met Laurie in Nice, and he says about Nice, Dirty old hole, isn't it? He added with a look of disgust as they drove along the boulevard to the Place Napoleon in the old city. And then she says, the dirt is picturesque, so I don't mind. The river and hills are delicious and these glimpses of the narrow cross streets are my delight. So here again, these new eyes, the American eyes that the narrator comment on when, commented on when Amy left the United States um, are, yeah, are drawn to the forefront. And she even sees the very dirt of the place as picturesque. So she's basically ordering everything she sees um, and sort of seeing and recounting only that that sort of confirms to her expectations of Europe as picturesque. Um, and where she has already seen sort of the picturesque of the Irish coast in the passage before, here she sees it in the filth of Nice. Everything confirms her vision of Europe as a continent of picturesque beauty, rendering her unable to see anything but what confirms her artistic sensibility. And there's another really interesting passage that I won't comment on for time reasons because I want to move on to the next part where um, Amy and Laurie basically fall in love with each other while sitting on this beautiful Swiss lake. Um, but the, the quote is in the PowerPoint and you will be able to, it's in your reading as well, you'll be able to, to see it afterwards. So basically, yeah, let's move on to the second trip um, when Alcott was already an, a celebrated author and the kind of writing that resulted from it was very different. So here, the Alcott sisters, um, Luisa on the left, and then there's May in the middle, uh, were joined by their friend Alice, um, and they departed from New York on a French steamer named Lafayette. They did not depart from Boston like the year the travel before. Um, and they the, their travels took them, and I have this great map. Their travels took them to France, to Switzerland, to Italy, Germany, and England. And this tour was again meant to give Luisa, who was um, who was struggling with the success and celebrity from Little Women, a reprieve to regain her health. They did visit cities, um, but mostly, um, for instance, they visited the Maypole Inn in homage to Dickens. They they did visit several um, touristic spots and cities, but mostly they um, were in rural spaces and interested in this nature um, and, yeah, not that interested in sort of European urbanity, um, even though there is a really interesting case of urban catastrophe in, in Alcott's writing when, she, when they're in Rome and the Tiber floods and uh, she writes about the many victims of this flooding and what it does to the city and the cat catastrophe of that. But for most part, um, the sisters and Alice um, spent most of, spent a long period of time um, at a pension by Madame Cost in Dinan. And it, here are different illustrations of May of, of Madame Cost and of their surroundings. Um, so they spent a lot of time there, and then they were also stranded in Switzerland uh, during the Franco-Prussian War for months before they were able to leave for Italy um, in early October. Um, yeah. And from their trips home, the Alcott sisters wrote, uh, from their trips, the Alcott sisters wrote to family and friends back home in Concord. Their letters were being read aloud at fireside meetings, um, and this is interesting because they're being read just like the letters um, of uh, the March father from the Civil War is being read in, in Little Women. So the fictional March sisters read the, the letters from the father. Um, while Louisa was writing, uh, May drew these pictures which accompanied the letters. May also wrote sometimes, but also provided many illustrations. Um, for the letters, and the collected correspondence really shows how 
Luisa's letters and Amy's pencil drawings depend on another and sort of draw on each other um, and require this kind of cross media or transmedia reading of both alongside each other. So there, Luisa's letters and May's sketches cooperate and sometimes even compete with another. Um, when, for instance, Luisa writes that she won't waste paper describing the pretty place, and this is a castle that they encountered because May can just draw it and, and that would do much better than her words. Um, their father began to transcribing the letters um, in the hopes of them being published as a volume. And Daniel Sheely's amazing edition, Little Women Abroad, the Alcott Sisters Letters from Europe, is a really great resource that collects all of the letters and illustrations. So all of the illustrations and, that I'm using in this talk are from Little Women Abroad, and it's a great resource for Alcott scholars. Um, yeah, so exhausted by the requests of her publishers and readers, this trip was supposed to be, as Alcott writes, a, quote, wild goose chase after health and pleasure. So for her to regain strength and for May to study at the best art schools in Europe, just like Amy does in Little Women. And I love these illustrations um, of, of May's of Alcott and of Alice. Um, there are so many of those when they're just sitting and reading or resting. So yeah, those I really enjoy a lot. Um, however, as I already told you, um, she did write several short stories on the trip. And when they were in Rome, she wrote the entire book Little Men while she was in Rome. And ultimately after her return, Alcott started conceiving a travel book based on these letters um, and illustrations. Uh, and this book is called Shawl Straps. It was published in 1873. And it's about three American women whose travels, um, the women and their travels are really easily recognizable as, as um, Luisa, May, and Alice. And um, they have similar experiences yeah, so it's, it's very much based on the letters, sometimes word for word if you have both alongside each other. Um, Shawl Straps was first serialized in the periodical Christian Union during March and April 1872, and it was then published um, in November 1872 as the second volume of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag series. And again, I already mentioned that she had experience of writing in the sketch form from her, from her time as a Civil War nurse in hospital sketches. So we, she is familiar with this form, the form of the sketch um, from before. Alcott was also inspired by the successful travel book um, that is Mark Twain's The Innocent. Oh, here's, here's by the way, on the left side is the cover of Charles Straps. Um, and then we have um, the other travel book that very much influenced her in, for Charles Straps, and that's Mark Twain's um, The Innocents Abroad or the New Pilgrim's Progress from 1869. And this is another instance or another really great example of this kind of humorous travel writing. Twain in The Innocents Abroad satirizes innocence um, and has this kind of develops this democratic humor that jabs at European aristocracy and at old world elitism. However, the, and, and Alcott's book does this too. Unlike Twain's book, Alcott's um, does not have concrete information about routes, about travel itineraries, and places that the reader should visit. We find much more of that in, in Innocence Abroad. So it's really interesting because the reviewers of Charles Streps praised this, quote, book of travel with most of the travel left out, unquote. This was the Boston Daily Advertiser. But Alcott as, is very clear on, on that not being the goal of the book. In the preface, she informs us that, um, or the narrative voice informs us that the book is confined to the personal haps and mishaps, adventures and experiences of her wanderers. And there are many of these, there are many really humorous great moments in that. I think one of my favorite is this great passage in which um, a celebrated French castle that they decide to visit then turns out as the shelter of vagrant hogs and hens and especially the, the wild, aggressive pigs who occupy the ruins keep the tourists from being able to enter it and, and um, enjoying the vistas. And I didn't bring a quote from that because it's a really long passage, in it, but it's really fun to read that. 
So there's a lot of humor and there's a lot of humor that we already find in the letters um, and that have these many funny everyday observations and escapades. Um, and many of those are language related because aside from Alice, none as, as <laughs> neither Louisa nor May could speak French, only Alice could. So we get, and this is from the letters, oh, sorry. Um, Louisa writes, everything is so funny that we shall soon laugh ourselves fat. They offer us at table dishes of snails, which they pick with pins and eat like ants. And other messes equally inviting. They call each other pet names that convulse us. My little pig, my sweet hen, my cabbage, and my tomcat. French lady with her son and daughter board here and their ways amuse us mightily. The girl is to be married next week to a man she has seen twice and never talked to but an hour in her life. So we really have this perspective on marriage here. That's a very American perspective. Um, and again, uh, as if anticipated, um, or uh, sort of recalling Louisa's descriptions of Amy and Little Women that I gave you in the part before, um, May is, is in awe of her surroundings uh, as Louisa's letters reveal to us. So Louisa writes about her sister, May is in a state of unutterable like bliss and keeps flying out with her big sketchbook and coming back in despair for everything is so picturesque, again, picturesque, she don't know where to begin. And a month later, May writes, I very much admire the primitive, simple manners and customs of the people here, so much so that our life at home begins to seem a little artificial and unattractive to me. So there's this notion of, of being changed through travel and also this Really interesting setting side by side European and, and American manners here. Uh, in Charles Straps, Alcott also presents a character who turns to the European sites of her youth, just as she is doing. Um, so, for instance, she returned to Switzerland in 1870, four years after she had met Laddie there. And her letter then reads So she's at the same hotel. Two days at the great hotel used me up as much as two weeks of travel. Things look very natural here, but more lovely than before, and the girls like it, so we may stay some time. In Shawl Straps, she presents this from the perspective of a character that she calls Lavinia as her alter ego, and Lavinia is named after an Italian maid that worked for Alcott during her time in Rome. Um, and for instance, her entire family is sheltered by the Alcotts when the Tiber overflows. This Lavinia alter ego um, calls this called by the narrator a somber spinster who broods over her past and suffers from headaches and yes, is struggling physically and emotionally, almost too much to enjoy her vacation. Um, so it's really interesting that in a way, Alcott sort of has taken up the role of Anna Weld um, here and is really struggling with her health and is now not the governess accompanying, but the person who's, who's uh, struggling physically here. And she, there, there, in the letters and in the, um, in the novel as well, there's several instances where Louisa and the Lavinia character um, marvel at the two other women who go hiking, who are full of energy and who do all these things while she needs to rest. Um, and yeah, that's there's an interesting um, parallel here. There's also the the, pa the paragraph that I gave you before. The three women end up watching a French wedding and are amused by the dramatic behaviors in Charles Straps that is in the ill-matched couple and the struggles to leave the crowded church when no carriages are available. And they celebrate their independence um, um, and their unity with each other by proclaiming then uh, spinsters forever um, on page 50. So again, we have here this sort of criticism of aristocratic families and marriage um, from a very American perspective, and that is similar to the ways that, that Twain talks about aristocracy as well. So Alcott is very critical of royal spectacles like this wedding. Another interesting thing is of course the title giving shawl straps. Um, the women were traveling in, in the, the characters in the novel just as much as the women in the, the letters were traveling with um, casual, comfortable clothes. They had what Alcott calls plain traveling suits. Um, and in the novel, 
um, in, in the letters they write about wearing bloomers, very scandalous. They write about wearing bloomers and, and masculine buckled shoes. But in the novel, this is then changed to confirm with class expectations. We don't have mentions of wearing bloomers in the novel, but we do have a mention of the practical shawl straps. So the, the picture that you see below, the way of carrying um, your belongings uh, in this carpet made material um, and sort of just wrapping it up and carrying it with you, traveling with a little packet, with a little luggage. Um, so in general, this shawl strap here stands for the freedoms that these women take during their travels. Um, they go on hikes, they go rowing boats, um, and true to their transcendentalist upbringing, um, they engage in all these outdoor activities enjoy, and enjoy nature um, when Alcott's health permits it. Um, now, finally, I think what's, I have a couple of quotes from the ending of Shawl Straps because those are really interesting. That the ending is really interesting because here there's this direct call to the reader to embark on a similar adventure. Um, first, there's a summary of that can account for the letters just as much as um, the novel. In spite of many prophecies to the contrary, three women utterly unlike in every respect, had lived happily together for 12 long months, had traveled unprotected safely over land and sea, had experienced two revolutions, an earthquake, an eclipse, and a flood, yet met with no loss, is how the novel is basically summarized at the end. And then the narrator of Shawl Straps calls upon the Amandas, Matildas, and Lavinias, those are the alter egos of um, Alice, May, and Lisa, of America to travel as well. And there's a lengthy, I apologize for the long quote here, but I'll just read this to you because there's so much in here. With this triumphant statement as a morale to our tale, we would respectfully advise all timid sisters now lingering doubtfully on shore to strap up their bundles in light marching order and push boldly off. They will need no protector but their own courage, no guide but their own good sense and Yankee wit, and no interpreter, if that woman's best gift, the tongue, has a little French polish to it. Um, wait for no man, but take your little store and invest it in something far better than Paris finery, Geneva jewelry, or Roman relics. Bring home empty trunks, if you will, but heads full of new and larger ideas, hearts richer in the sympathy that makes the whole world kin. Leave discontent, frivolity, and feebleness among the ruins of the old world and bring home to the new the grace the culture and the health, which will make American women um, what they just fail of being, the bravest, brightest, happiest, and handsomest women in the world. So there's really the celebration of female independence here, but also of traveling lately, of, of the um, maturity that you may achieve while traveling. And it's, it's a really interesting way of ending um, shawl straps and encouraging others to write as well. So we do have this instruction here um, that we otherwise lack from this as a travel guide. There's an encouragement that it ends with. Um, to end with the, with the actual travel for different practical reasons, um, the three travelers all returned separately to the US. First, Alice returned in May, um, to comment on sort of how this ends for Alice. Alice remained close with the Alcott sisters, um, and she wrote a short piece herself and with Lisa's help got that published and it has a great title. It's called Our Apartment, A Practical Guide to those intending to spend a winter in Rome. And in the style, it's very much similar to, to Shawl Straps as well. In Shawl Straps, Louisa writes about Alice and this quote, even though fictional, demonstrates their closeness after this shared year of travel. She writes about Alice here in form of, of a character named Amanda. Amanda hurried home with friends to enjoy a festive summer among the verdant plains of Cape Cod. Cape Cod. With deep regret did her mates bid her adieu and nothing but the certainty of soon embracing her again would have reconciled Livy, so it's Louisa, to the parting. For in Amanda, she found that rare and precious treasure, a friend. Livy had searched long years for a friend to her mind and got one at last. Um, so Livy, Louisa, remained in Rome. And it was there that she heard of the tragic death, uh, death of her brother-in-law, John Pratt. Um, and after, yeah, I have a picture of him who had 
after his death basically left her sister Anna and the children without income. And this had inspired then, this inspired Alcab then to write a novel to both honor her brother-in-law and to support Anna's family. So she began writing Little Men in Rome in January 1871. And she wrote in her diary that she wrote Little Men so that John's death may not leave Anna and the dear little boys in want. In writing and thinking of the little lads to whom I must be a father now, I found comfort for my sorrow. So I think it's really interesting what gender transition is occurring here, that she does not understand herself as a mother for these, these um, her sister's children, but as a father figure for them who also financially provides. Um, Louisa, in May, in May, two weeks after Alice, Louisa traveled to the US again. And her publisher actually came to meet her at New York Harbor to celebrate with her that Little Men was for sale. It, it was published the day for copyright reasons. It started being published the day she entered the country again. Um, and there were 50,000 copies sold in advance. Um, so again, another success story of hers. Her sister May decided to stay in Europe until um, November 1873. I know she. She, returned, she stayed until November 1871, but returned to Europe in 1873 and stayed. Um, so she became an expatriate. She met um, a Swiss, Swiss businessman whom she married in London and lived in Paris, um, where she began to exhibit her paintings. And there's a really interesting collection that I want to bring to your attention, The Forgotten Alcott, um, which is the first academic study on May Alcott Nerecure. Um, and about her paintings um, and this network of expatriate female painters that she was involved in. Um, yeah. She also published another guide like Alice and like Louisa, she published a guide um, based on their travels, which is called um, American Artists in Europe Studying Art Abroad and How to Do It Cheaply, which is interesting because her entire travel, even the later travels, depended so much on her sister's income. She had a daughter whom she named Louisa after her sister, but she died when the child, not in childbirth, but a couple of months after the child was born. And um, actually it was Ralph Alder Emerson who received the telegram with the news of her death and brought that to Louisa and the Alcott family. They then asked for the, May's daughter then was sent to the US to be adopted by Louisa and to be raised by her famous aunt. And yeah, I think with that, I am coming to an end. And I hope that this was interesting and helpful for you. I mean, keep in mind, this is a very privileged kind of travel, specifically the second travel and that I'm talking about this very privileged tradition of American travel in the 19th century. Um, but it is really interesting to see the many literary echoes that it produced on both sides of the Atlantic and the networks that resulted from this and enabled this. So I'd like to end with yet another quote from Laura Dessa Walls, and this speculates on Alcott's continued popularity. Um, so it sort of ties back to the beginning of my talk when I talked about her sort of being still so widely read and popular. Um, and Dessa Walls says, asks, is this why we today still read Alcott as a living author? She hooks her characters in this to the same frightening historical uncertainties that continue to haunt us not as inexplicable events from elsewhere, but as the playing out on the world stage of the intimate battles that tear apart the street, the parlor, the bedroom, and the dinner table. And now in her travels, we have seen that these battles, these domestic, this kind of domestic realism um, becomes particularly interesting when sort of compared to her travels um, and, and to the different literary modes that she adopted at different stages of her career. Um, yeah, that in turn can be sort of the more um, celebratory depictions of little women and then moving on to sort of domestic realism turned humorous in, in shawl straps and the humorous travel writing tradition. So yeah, I'm eager to hear what you make of all this and I hope this was entertaining for you and yeah, thank you. And I have my bibliography on here as well, um, which there are a lot of sources there that I really recommend for anyone interested. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, really, 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 really interesting, uh, Maria. Um, 
important background, very solid and gives us a lot to think. So I see lots of hands up. I see hands clapping. I see all kinds of stuff. So um, are you ready to answer questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So more clapping hands. Now I need hands for questions. Or uh, comments. Yes. Sarah has a question. I see Sarah Berazi with a question. Yes. Hello. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, what do you think about the character of Joe? Because everybody talks about how Amy can be selfish and childish at times, but don't you think that Joe also uh, falls into those flaws? Because I mean, in all of the representations um, of the book that I've seen, she's sometimes she can be very tough. And not in the right way. So I just wanted to get your thoughts about this. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I think that was something that I also had in there that this is not an Joe is not an ideal character. She also um, she's not idealized. She also has her flaws, but these are flaws that specifically from today's perspective we can that that make her very compelling as this strong female characters. So these are flaws. She's angered really quickly. She's very impulsive. She's very strong willed and strong minded. But this must not have necessarily been the case to the readers at the time. Um, what? Yeah, so I mean, Joe also has her moments of selfishness and childishness. Those of you who read the novel know that originally, originally, but but Amy is able to travel because her aunt takes her with her and her aunt had I planned to take Joe, but then has a fallout with Joe because and Joe is too childish to even though she really wants to travel to um, Europe as well, and she never does. She's too childish and too stubborn to um, resolve things with her aunt, and that enables Amy to go. And then Joe instead goes to New York and we have in the book, we have this juxtaposition of Joe's very somber, but eloquently written letters from New York, writing about working there, about meeting um, uh, her future husband there, and then Amy's celebrations of Europe, which just in the context of having these two epistolary chapters um, follow upon or sort of in correspondence and in competition with each other makes, yeah, makes for a really interesting read and really adds to this um, further naivete of, of Amy. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's an important comment that you make that there's that Joe is also a flawed character. Um, but within the context of the novel, she is the very appealing character still, um, which is why so many people identify with her. Uh, maybe also to add to this, I find that in shawl straps, the Alcott um, alter ego character, the Lavinia character, is this cranky woman who is very, like, very self aware, who makes fun of herself, who uh, does not behave ideally the whole time? I really enjoy this. To, so, this Alka turning her alter ego character not into this ideal like Joe, but, but or into this great character that's so compelling, but also into this cranky older woman who just wants these younger women to go away and go on their hike and let her be and let her rest. And I think that's there's great humor in those passages. Um, yeah, that sort of is another side of, of Alcott's um, packaging herself in her writing. Yeah, but thank you. Fascinating. Thank you for an interesting answer. Jennifer has raised her hand. Hi, it's Jennifer. <laughs> Can you hear me? Hey. Uh, yeah. um, that was absolutely interesting. And uh, thank you so much for filling in so many gaps for us on, on the person of Louisa May Alcott. That was just brilliant. Um, question for you. Uh, I remember in Little Women, uh, Joe talks about being a father, or she's the man of the house uh, when father is gone. And then in this other book you referenced that she, she actually is reflecting that she's now a father to her nephews or to her, her nephews and nieces, I don't remember. Um, and oh, that was actually, no, that was a, sorry to interrupt you, but that was a letter that she wrote. Um, yeah, that was not part of Charles Preps. I'm sorry, but that, like, yes. I was a lot of sources here that was sort of, yeah, that was a letter that she wrote to her family. Okay. Yeah. So I was yeah. wondering if you could, uh, comment. 
more on this kind of masculine predisposition to gender. And the second part is, do you agree with um, the the uh, the the TV representation of her as being? Um, I, I, do you like the, that representation? Do you agree with it? Do you think it captures her 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 own geist, as it were? Mm -hmm. uh, let's start with that. I I think it's so compelling to have someone like Shosha Mamet play. I mean. All of the so so Dickinson as a TV show is very humorous, doesn't take itself too seriously, but gets a lot of things really right about this literary about literary personas. The the Thoreau representation is fascinating. Dickinson as a is fascinating, um, and there's like all these all these these people appear in the television show. Whitman appears, um, Edgar Allan Poe. So so Dickinson meets all these all the celebrities and. They're always exaggerated. Like this is obviously a very exaggerated representation of Alcott, but I do think that Shosha Mamet's sort of fast-talking, high-paced, very practically oriented, very physical, and and sort of going for a run, <laughs> running away from Emily. Dick like there's there's so much in there that I really enjoyed. I mean, of course, it's an it's an extreme exaggeration, but I found it very compelling um, and interesting. Um, Specifically, when it comes to this notion of this author who is just writing the whole time and and has been so incredibly productive, I find there's a lot there. I I mean, the one point where we could say that's problematic. I mean, she was obviously forced or wanted to provide for her family and was writing very commercially successful texts on purpose. However, we do know that she was frustrated. Um, with the little recognition that her more um, ambitious um, experiment, ex yeah, experimentations in writing, like moods, um, that they weren't received as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's the representation where I would would I would disagree a bit, um, but I do find it really interesting, and compelling. Um, and when it comes to gender and taking up this father. Figure. I mean, we always have to read this in the context of her own relationship to her father, right? And sort of the ways that she was very close with her father, but also had this intense criticism of what it means to be a father. And then all of her work is so preoccupied with father figures there who are entirely absent, um, but who are always found in the strangest places. And this interest in sort of providing um, male guidance and I do think that this is something like from today's perspective, we would probably read Alcott as sort of this queer character as someone who's transcending gender norms. Um, and I think these quotations really show that she wasn't really interested in becoming a mother at all, but in providing for her family. And um, yeah, I think you put it really well when you said that she's enacting this, this masculinity. Um, but we have to keep in mind that she was kind of, of forced to do so as well. Um, out of economic necessity. Yeah, I need to think more about this, but it's really interesting. And it's interesting how one of the most idealized characters of all male characters that she has, Laurie, is also someone who in many ways is very androgynous, who like Joe, and this is sort of the basis of their great friendship, um, transcends gender roles. And um, yeah, which is also, I think, why so many people would have loved to see um, a romantic relationship between these two characters, but which of course makes it so interesting that we are not that we are not so sort of basically rewarded with this heteronormative expectation of having the two come together. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else who has a comment that they'd like to to make or a question to ask? You guys are so many. I don't even see everybody online. On my panel, it's just amazing. Sarah has her hand. Is there. Sarah's hand up again? Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So, at the beginning, you showed us the quote about how that author wrote, compare the characters to the Harry Potter houses. <laughs> and that was yeah. very, I really like it. It was well thought out. So, I, w I wondered which one of the characters of the, of the four sisters is your least uh, favorite one? Thank you. My least favorite one. So that's so interesting because my least favorite one, like every, I, I'm leaning out of the window here, but I think 
almost everyone's least favorite character must have been Beth. And then I read Carmen Maria Machado's sort of redemption of Beth. And I'm like, wow, this is, yes, the text sort of leads us to disregarding Beth as too perfect and so absent. And um, there's no, there are these interesting moments of frustration and, um, but they're so rare and few that she's really invisible from the text. So I would have to say Beth, but um, after reading that redemption, I really want to go back and reread those parts of Little Women to see um, what I've overlooked there, basically. Um, yeah. Okay. May I Sorry. ask a question? Somebody wants to ask a question, please do. Uh, it's me, Siglinde. Oh, oh, that is Siglinde. Sorry, now yeah. I see it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you hear me, Maria? Yes. yes. Yes, I can hear you. Good, good, good. I also enjoyed your talk very much. And um, the portrait of uh, Louise May Alcott that you sketched and she shared with us was really fascinating because I looked at her from a new perspective. And it now only occurred to me how progressive she was. Mm -hmm. You showed us that she was the breadwinner, that she traveled all over the place, you know, that she was very self-determined and probably a proto-feminist. And she was also a member of the suffragette movement. Maybe yes. you want to talk about that a little bit more. She was sure. friends with Julia Howe. She met uh, Frederick Douglass. So she was very much um, yeah, progressive in, in so many ways. And there are two passages from her own recollections of her childhood. I don't know if you read that, but that really supports what you told us. And I just wanted to read this to you because I think it's so awesome. Uh, when she goes, um, and she wrote this as a 12 year old or something, I will do something by and by, don't care what, teach, so act, write, anything to help my family, which she did. And I'll be rich, which she did, amazingly enough. And famous, yes, she did. And happy before I die. And she also wrote in her journal at the age of 13, quote, people think I'm wild and queer, but mother understands and helps me, end of quote. It's really awesome, isn't it? That she, at a yeah. young age, foresaw her own future and the tremendous impact that she has had throughout the years up to now, today. I mean, here mm -hmm. we are in Freiburg talking about this person. Yeah. So maybe you want to just um, tell me a little bit more about, you know, and the many progressive and yeah, fascinating um, thank you. Because, persona. because you're absolutely right. I mean, what's really interesting is that it's not just her, but her whole family, right? So her mother is also involved with with this with women's family mm -hmm. and uh, suffrage and abolitionism, and her whole like she's part of this very political, um, transcendentalist circles with many women involved in that. So she, but it's now that you've mentioned, I think that one thing that that I hadn't even thought about that much before is that, yes, she's so political. Yes, we could see her as a proto-feminist, but still in so much of her writing, she very carefully avoids too much political commentary because still she's trying to be very commercially successful. And I mean, Joe does marry in the end. Um, there is this resolution where, where so many of her characters marry and it's only in this later text um, where she can really celebrate the spinsterhood um, and it's this autofictional text. Um, yeah, we'd call it autofiction today. It's really interesting. So she is part, but she, and she's never really written political commentary, which is also really interesting. She's very carefully steered. It was always fictional texts. Yes, she did have literary ambitions, but she's not really endorsing political issues um, um, through commentary, for instance. Um, as far as I know, so I think that's also really for good reasons. For good reasons, yeah, she wouldn't be as commercially successful if she did, for very good reasons. So again, this goes to show, I think, 
how savvy she is in knowing exactly what she can do at what point that she can write a text like shawl strap celebrating single women at this point in her career when she's so well established and and um is commercially um and has commercial success versus at an earlier point in her career where she's very carefully positioning and packaging herself and her work um and even this comment of being sort of a father for um for her sister's children this is of course a private letter that was not published but comments like that could have been problematic when published at the time this obvious transcending of gender roles um to tie back to jennifer's comment yeah i really i really enjoyed those quotes that you read i mean sort of the one addition that i can make is that even though her aspiration to die or to have this happy um, successful life. The one thing that we find again and again in her writing from her later years is this frustration about her bad health. So that was something that really impacted her happiness, um, that she was working so hard and she had all these health issues. She kept the letters in, that were the basis of shawl straps. In so many of these letters, she talks about going to doctors in Europe, having the severe pain, not knowing exactly what it is, trying different kinds of medicine, trying different treatments. So, um, but she keeps working um, and doesn't really rest that much. Um, so we have a workaholic here who's also likely struggling from burnout and other things, but who doesn't really pause. So she she seemed she seems like a very happy person in her writing and her letters and her journals, but she is struggling with health issues. And I think that ties in really well with Anna's Harriet Martino um, talk as well. Yeah, but thank you. So again, that's that's a really important point about her political connections, even though they don't really surface in her work that much, or not explicitly, but implicitly, of course. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. I, I have maybe a a, a weird comment of, uh, <laughs> or a question about realism. You know, I've worked mm -hmm. for a while on realism, um, not reading too many women, unfortunately, but I, I sort of made the observation when I compared um, William Dean Howells and Henry James that William Dean Howells uh, writes characters who are totally lively and compared to this, Henry James right, uh, um, creates wooden characters, you know, that are not as lively, realistic. He doesn't have the same ear for like uh, easy conversation. And, mm. and uh, at one point, I also read Fanny Fern and I compared Fanny Fern to Hawthorne and I made sort of the similar observation that I thought, you know, she was so much more funny and had an ear for how people talk, you know, whereas somebody like Hawthorne, you know, I mean, this is all very interesting, but, you know, um, it's not a tape recorder ear type of type of thing. It's. And so I wondered if you ever made similar observations about about these women who just write um, in a much more socially involved way. They're just looking at society and taking it in and and reporting on it, whereas many of the men are are sort of blocked by all kinds of weird ideas, um, and and they're, they're not as direct, in my opinion. That's just a, a very general type of prejudice that I seem to be having. I like that because you're you're thinking about it stylistically. And I would say if you would have asked me before that comment, if I think Alcott had more in common with Howells or with James, I would have said with James because of the, the because of the theme, obviously, and because of the way that they're interested in how because what I like about Henry James a lot is sort of this attention to class and how class um structures so many conversations and, and is so often in the room without really being being a topic. Um, and this is something that I think Alcott also does really well. But you're right, when it comes to sort of the spoken word and the liveliness and the humor and sort of the everyday, finding the humor in sort of everyday occurrences while traveling, that's something that we find in Alcott. And that is also, I think, the reason why her work has aged so well and it continues to fascinate people because there's just, yeah, I guess the closest person is Twain when it comes to the humorous travel writing, because there's a similar interest in interest in sort of the anecdotal 
um, humor, but then also milking that for, or not milking, but sort of um, unfolding that into sort of developing these these larger sociopolitical transatlantic relevances. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really compelling. Um, yeah. But but that's like the whole philosophical background. What I was interested in is just Every hearing day. these voices that sound yeah. so unbelievably contemporary and fresh. Like you know, yeah, yeah, like it's, little. It, it's like somebody down the road who who just said that or who had that human interaction that is 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 is, is absolutely fascinating. I also think that even though I, let me let me say I, there are passages that I'm only now thinking of where Alcott sort of plays with the expectance of being this proper upper class privileged traveler who then um, has a certain way of speaking and then sort of plays with this and, and the way that she should talk to discuss, for instance, the pigs roaming the castle ruin and sort of, oh my, <laughs> making fun of that in a way where you're, you, you know very well that she's carefully constructing this to be humorous, but she makes fun of herself and her own expectations as a traveler in this. So there's a really interesting um, way that she uses literary personas, including speech um, for humorous effect. Mm -hmm. There's this this kind of meta meta consciousness yes. where she basically sees how crazy things are, and then she knows also that she would have to behave properly, and and at the same time she's aware of this and she's making us feel it. I also thought that your your example of the picturesque, you know, that you mm -hmm. gave, is 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 very ironic. And, yeah. and so it's basically she's aware, it. she's aware of it that it's a cliche, and she's basically making fun of it. Which basically again means you know you're you're in a in an interpersonal space. You're not just in a realm of of ideology and discourse, you know. But she's she's very carefully establishing that she's making fun of it, but the character of Amy believes it and enjoys it. And here we have again the innocent abroad. Here yep. we have the Eve person. That's who, the Mark Twain type of thing. Yeah, sure, yeah. I see that. <laughs> yeah. And then it's interesting that she basically recycles this with her own sister years later when she travels to Europe for the first time and okay. um, sort of May becomes Amy five years later, um, as she already had anticipated in Little Women. Yeah. Fascinating. How do people cope with this corpus? Because it's actually she wrote a whole lot, right? Yeah. So just to, to, to become uh, an Alcott person, you know, you have to spend quite a lot of time reading uh, all of this material yeah um there's which is why i gave you the bibliography of the works that i use because i relied a lot about the secondary sources i've read a lot of her work but i haven't like there's so much of it and specifically the the Sheely collection is just like it's so thick so pages upon pages upon pages and i was really glad i had the pdf and could search in there for certain German capitals, Swiss capitals, um, and uh, city, okay. you know, cities, uh, spaces that they visited to, to compare it to Little Women um, and compare it to Charles Straps. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How did, okay, so Maya asks, how did the Alcott sisters like the idea that the March sisters are based on them? Um, we don't really have a lot of accounts. I mean, um, Lizzie, we can guess, probably did not like this character being based on her. Um, May, I mean, we, what we do know is that sometimes the sisters wrote to Luisa adopting their fictional characters. So there was some humor involved. When May writes to Luisa calling herself Amy, uh, writing to Joe, I mean, there's this is, I think this has sort of become the family in joke. And since mm -hmm. the whole family depended on it financially, we can speculate that they endorsed this. I mean, again, we have this very careful control of public image. We don't have anyone from the family writing or and we don't have any collections or any statements that would contest that retrospectively and cause controversy because there was this very carefully craft version or narrative craft by Alcott and the publishers that this family is the Alcott family, basically. Um, and we wouldn't have any accounts of the sisters saying that they just like this. Because again, what is they were very much aware of what they're saving. We 
the reason that we have all these letters from their travels is because their father copied them and saved them. Um, so the family was very aware that Luisa was a celebrity and that they were contributing to her success by how they behaved. I mean, they had people visiting the estate, taking, trying to see her. Um, when they were on the, the steamer traveling to Europe, people were asking for her autograph. Um, people in the US were writing in newspapers about what Luisa May and Alice were doing in Europe, where they were eating, where they were seen. So they really were these celebrities. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of image control that goes into that. Um, it's really interesting. Cool. Thank you very much. Sarah has yet another question. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I was wondering, because I personally think that sometimes we appreciate classics because of the context they were written, written in. So do you think that Little Woman would have been this acclaimed if it was published uh, in our time? Thank you. Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, hard to say. I do think the context is really important here. But maybe Jennifer has an opinion on that, and that's why you raised her. I just I, I wonder if I mean that quote that you put up about how enduring I'm sorry, her themes are that she's yeah. she's addressing something that and I don't know when that quote was from, but that she's addressing things that are, are kind of still unfolding in the American drama. Mm -hmm. Um I I would question whether her texts wouldn't find legitimacy now because she has these strong women, you know, it's very feminist. There's like several different ways you can be a successful woman. You can be a mother. You can be, I mean, I, I don't know, uh, you know, you can be a writer, you can die <laughs> tragically, you know, you've got tens of options left open to you. Um, the civil war, um, you know, issues of race, gender, I think, I mean, I understand it's Victorian and there are some like very clear boundaries that she has to stick to, but I, I can't see that those boundaries have lost their uh, yeah. legitimacy now. I mean, especially in America. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great answer. Um, I mean, the only thing that I would maybe push back on a little is that it's, it's, it's gotten much harder to write the kind of multi-generational bestseller that really people, I mean, we don't really have the kinds of books that were passed, that are passed on from generation to generation to generation. Um, it's, it's gotten harder to write those. And um, it would be really interesting to see what those will be from our generation. I mean, obviously probably Harry Potter, but yeah. Um, so I think in, in part, the whole context of, Alcott writing, and Wolfgang's going to talk more about this, writing about the Civil War and publishing Little Women so shortly after the Civil War really spoke to um, a desire of, of readers to read this kind of text at that time. Um, normalcy. Normalcy. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, I don't know. Even though I do find Jennifer's answer really convincing. I'm kind of torn on that because I think yes, on the one hand, but on the other, um, yeah, but it's always, I mean, it's always really hard to speculate what's going to be a big literary classic, <laughs> otherwise we would all be writing them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, if, if everybody's happy and I think everybody's extremely happy. Maria, that was a wonderful presentation. I, I think we had an interesting discussion and we all learned a lot. We could all express ourselves. So um, I think we can be very happy with this result. Um, we can call it call it a day. I see a lot of hands here up now. See, everybody's very happy. In two weeks, we're going to have uh, Philip Schweighauser, who is going to talk about Emily Dickinson. And that is very probably also going to be extremely exciting. And I really look forward to seeing as many people next time because this is quite a success i'm very proud you know to have so many names on my screen and so many pictures this is fantastic and i think this this whole project of an ears 
you know, lecture cycle that was started last year by Wolfgang is, uh, is fairly successful and I hope it's going to continue in the future. Anyway, see you guys in two weeks. Thank you, Maria, again very much. Thank you. Thank that you for being here. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And please, if I'm not here, I think I will be, but if I'm not here, please, someone ask Philip about uh, the time that Alcott took Dickens and Jocking and see what he okay. looks like. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's try to remember that. Yes. Okay. It, Thank exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> wonderful. Bye. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. It's been wonderful.